Horizon. I'm Brother Shelley, and I'd like to welcome you to Life Application, where practical teaching gives the birth to the demonstration of God's Word. I would like to continue our series, or we're going to continue our series out of our study that we've been looking at for the past couple of weeks. Paul had us in a particular area out of the book of Romans. He's called Practical Christianity. It's called Practical Christianity. And this practical Christianity is basically the everyday application of the gospel in the life of the Christian. And through these teachings, you know, through this particular series of messages, the Apostle Paul is now, I would say, bringing the Christian along in his attitude, his walk of life, and he's basically showing us the practicality of the life of a Christian or a believer. Now, in the particular, in the particular text we've been already moving through, we've looked at a couple of verses, or we looked at one main verse that was actually Romans chapter 12, verse 9, and we've dealt with some powerful subjects and powerful points out of it. Today we're going to move forward in our teaching, and Paul's going to continue to unfold more lessons for the believer in our practical walk or our practical everyday life. But before we move on, if you want mind, I would like to go to the throne of grace and we'll have prayer. So if everyone will bow their heads, we'll have prayer. Our Father and our God, we, we enter your throne of grace, Father, as humbly as we know how. First, Father, we want to just thank you for being the God that you are. Thank you for the many things you've done for us through these trying times and, and, and through social unrest and, and through epidemics. And we just want to first thank you for just being who you are. We're peculiar people, Father, and strange as we are, we'll, we'll look to no one else but you because you're God and God alone. Now we ask, Father, that you just be with us through this time of studying and, 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 and getting into your word. We pray, we pray you remove all stumbling blocks and, 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 and all kind of distractions in the minds and the hearts of your people so that we may gain an understanding of this, your word. We pray we remove the man that's, that's standing at the podium that's teaching this word and just, Father, fill him with only what you have for him to teach your people. We pray that this day is a, a productive day in their hearts and minds and that the anointing that you give them, Father, is from you and you alone. Now as we usher in the spirit we pray that this 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 word now is engulfed in the minds and the heart of each and every one of us and we 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 approach life in a way that's pleasing in our sight and we'll be ever so careful to give you all praise and honor and glory for us in jesus name we ask it all let every heart say amen we have been dealing with this particular area out of the book of romans chapter 12 verses 9 through 21 and here in these verses, the Apostle Paul teaches us how every Christian should behave in the family of God. And keep in mind that here in verses 9 through 13, that Paul presents his third picture of a Christian here in Romans chapter 12, which is a brother in the family. A brother in the family. Now, what Paul has actually done here, he's actually laid out our walk in a, as a Christian in a, off of the scale of a family life or the family life of a believer. We've already discussed in verse 9 where Paul taught us that our love should be honest and without hypocrisy. In other words, we should hate evil and cling to what's good. Hate evil, cling to what's good. Now, in today's lesson, we want to continue by looking at verse 10, which brings our discussion on the thought, duty, to the family of God, duty to the family of God. It focuses on verses 10 through 13, and notice that this second phrase of verses concerning the idea of supernatural living presents a much wider scope concerning our responsibility as Christians towards other Christians. Paul is laying out, and he's bringing up the fact that we still have a responsibility to fellow Christians. That's what he's working on. That's what he's teaching us today. So now, here in verse 10, Paul declares this out of Romans chapter 12, verse 10. He says this. He says, be kindly affectionate to one another and with brotherly, with brotherly love in honor giving preference to one another. This text of scripture, I want you to don't, don't run through it because it's a lot of meat in it, and I need you to see it. I need you to make sure you, you get it in your mind. He says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. And then it says, in honor, giving preference to one another. Now, 
In this verse, Paul talks about the idea of honoring love. Honoring love. And when you talk about honoring love, it actually means to giving weight to love, giving preference to love, giving place to love. And, and based on this verse in verse 10, Paul is telling us that Christian love is, is, to, is to be open, honest, and it's also. And, and here's the thing. It's to be open, honest, and then it also honors the love. When it says open and honest, it means this, your love has to be transparent. It has to be without strength. It has to be without any kind of strings attached, any kind of ulterior motives. When it says an open love, it means it's pure love, nothing attached to it. Then it says not only it has to be that way, then it says it has to be honest, truthful, honest love. Love has a way that it carries its own weight, which means this. True love is truthful, and, and, and with, unless man messes with it, only true love can be that truthful. True love will tell the truth whether you want to hear it or not. It will straighten the situation out whether you like it or not. Honest love means this, whether you like to hear it, whether it's good or bad, it is still that love. Then it moves along and he says this, and, and, and not only that, then it, it also honors, it honors, it honors the love. It gives weight to the one that's love, which is the, the people of God. Now you have to understand this. Paul expresses real Christian family love here. He's talking about a way of life for believers as Christians, how we should live in life. And that's an area that Christians, we have to revisit from time to time because I think as usual and through Scripture, we always find ourselves getting off track when it comes to love. Our love kind of fades. And true and honestly, when we think about this type of love, you have to realize it can fade because it's something of the will. It's not of the emotions, it's of the will, and if you don't protect yourself, it can fade away. So, verse 10 is divided into two major parts, and the first part is found in this phrase right here. This phrase says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. Now, it's given us, it's given us a command what to look for, and this is the reason why, this is what's going on. In this statement, Paul commands us, be, be devoted to, in brotherly love. Be devoted in brotherly love. Now, here's the deal. It starts off with the attitude that's involved in this command is made very plain and clear. Paul wants us to understand that, that, that this is not enough just to say we love the brethren. We have to demonstrate our brotherly love. Here's the issue. Here's what he's laying out. Listen to what we said. Listen to why I started off. First, I started off with attitude. I say it's the attitude of the believer. So now this particular lifestyle depends on your attitude. It means this, you have to adjust your attitude from worldly to spiritually to Christian family. So now first thing you got to do is you got to get your attitude in check. Christian family love or the walk of a Christian requires your attitude to be brought under submission. See, your attitude or, the, or, or your attitudes, as we like to say, because most of us have more than one attitude because we flip-flop. Christian attitude is only one attitude, and that's an attitude based off of, what, off of the Spirit of God and, and His Holy Spirit that's in you. So it says, first and foremost, you got to get your attitude in the check. Then it says, the attitude is involved, and this is a command is a command. Now, when you hear the word command, it's actually a military term. It actually means it is a request made by a higher authority. It's a request made by a higher authority. Here in this position, it's the apostle Paul is writing to believers. Paul has the authority from the kingdom of God to write commands because God commanded him to write a command. And what he's doing is he's commanding the people, and his, this command is plain and clear. It's, it's not hidden. It's a plain and clear command. And listen to what it is. Paul wants us to understand that, that it's just not enough to say, I love you. How, 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 how well can a Christian, how much does a Christian say every day that I just love you, I love you, I love you, bye, I love you when I see you. But how many of us really just say that, and how many of us really mean it? Amen. See, it says here, Paul says here, this love has to be demonstrated. Yeah. See, 
Love is an action and it has to be seen. Otherwise, all it is is a word. So he comes about it. He says it has to be demonstrate brotherly love. Now, there are two key words, two key words that stand out in this phrase in verse 10a. There's two words. I want you to listen. I want you to work with me on them. First, Paul declares that we are to be kindly affectionate to one another. The first word I want you to see out of the word kindly affectionate is the word kindly. It's based on the word kin. The word kindly is based on the word kin. Now, this, 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 this word kindly is based on the word kin, which we get the terminology family. It brings about family. Now, now the, the, the word the word affectionate means there's a love existing between two family members. So when you hear the word kin, it's an affectionate term between two family members. Now, we are now understand what that means because we have family reunions all the time. We have family gatherings. Here at this particular season, it's, it's different this year because family's not going to be able to gather like they once did. But this terminology kin would meant it was an affectionate term between family members. What Paul is teaching us, the family of God, the church family, we should be a family also. And this type of love should be experienced between believers. Now, not to put the blame on one or the other, listen to this. The word kindly, based on kin, and the word is an affectionate word, which means love existing between family members. So the phrase kindly affectionate, means this, it means bound by a family tie. If you did not know it, if you are born again and you are in the kingdom of God, we are all bound together with a family tie. We are a part of a family and God is our father and we are bound together as brothers and sisters. Here's the deal, think about it. This command, go back to the command. This command is dealing with the Christian family the brothers, the sisters within the church. Paul has now brought it closer to home, and he's now talking about brothers and sisters within the church. When we say within the church, we mean born-again believers. I'm not talking about a church in particular. I'm talking about all of those who say that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you've been baptized, you believed in him, that is your family. No matter if they're on the other side of the world or on this side of the world, they are your brethren and sisters. So here's the deal. Paul says he making it plain and clear, plain and clear that you understand what's going on. Now, let's move further. The point that Paul is making is this. It doesn't matter a person's background, his race, his nationality, his occupation, his wealth or education or even whether we see, whether we are attracted to him, love one, or whether we like the believer. He says you are still kin to him. Now, he's just given us this list. And I hope you listen to the list closely because I ain't through with that list. He just did something and he wants us to understand it. He says we are bound by the Christian family, by the blood ties through, through Jesus Christ. The shed blood of Christ has tied us all together in a family. Not only did it tie us together, it tied us together all over the world. Not just here. If you're a Christian, you should be able to, you, you, you're still tied to Christians in California. You're tied to Christians all over the land. Now, here's the deal. Listen to what he's saying. Listen to this. Paul makes it clear in our text out of Romans 12, chapter 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 10a, he says that we are to be kindly affectionate to them. That means all the little people that I described a moment ago, we are still to be kindly affectionate to them. Now, here's the deal. I want you to hear this particular text of Scripture before I move into it and, and start to dissecting what, what I think is going to be very powerful for us. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 is a text that we're going to look at. This particular text of scripture is going to lead to the attitude and the working of a believer in how we can accomplish what we're, we're to do. Now, it says this in, Rome, in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. It says this, keep your heart with all diligence, 
for out of it spring the issues of life. This particular text of scripture, it goes with us when we look at the point that Paul is making is that it doesn't matter a person's background, race, nationality, occupation, wealth, or education, or even whether we are attracted to or like another believer. We still have an obligation to love. What Proverbs is saying the other is we have to control our heart and ourselves. When it says keep your heart diligent, your heart is the seat of all your emotions. Out of your heart is where all your issues are going to come from. So it says get it in your heart that these are my brothers and sisters and then protect that idea. See, most times what we do is we don't actually get it in our spirit and then when we get it in our spirit or we don't get it in our heart, we don't protect it with diligence. It says protect it with due diligence. The text actually says with all diligence. When it says with all diligence, it means prioritizing, protecting of yourself. Now, here's the issue. Here's the issue I want you to see. When you're protecting your heart with all diligence, it means protecting your mindset. It means protecting your walk, protecting your talk. It's several issues that the heart actually picks up. The heart of the human body is where the blood pumps from. And if you ever notice, if your heart gives you trouble, most of the time you will die. So the heart is referenced to the spirit here because what it's saying is it is the seat of mankind. When you hear heart spoke of in the Bible, it's actually talking about the seat of mankind. So what it's saying is protect your way and attitude in life and protect your thought on brotherly love. Now, here's the deal. We have to learn to protect it because listen to what's going on. It says no matter a person's background, when you're protecting your heart means is once you get your mindset on a believer, you can't change it around. See, it's no matter if I came in here and I had been a drug dealer, don't mean if I was an ex-embezzler, don't mean if I was an ex-republican, a criminal, a crook. Paul said is your background it doesn't matter. You're still in the family of God. See, how many times do we hold people hostage when we find out what they used to do in life? Now you're something different. So I don't love you. I don't shine. I don't give you family love because you're not really one of us. See, we look at background and background is one of the things that hold us back. And the problem is, is and I'm not I'm going to be honest about it. Sometimes it's hard to do. Sometimes a background or you may have had an issue in the, you know, in the past with a person because background is dealing with the past. And in the past, you may have had a problem with the person. But the issue is, is now because of who you are and now because of who they are, that background doesn't matter anymore. Amen. See, yes, before in the past we threw rocks and we fought or whatever issue we had with each other. Kids may have been at, at war with each other. Who knows what the problem is? But when it says background, it means the past. No matter what has happened in the past, we put it aside, and now we have to walk in a way of family love. Yes. See, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange thing that, that we look and we bring the past up, but God tells us to leave the past where it is. We want to judge people over their past, but we fail to realize we had a past also. Amen. See, for every time somebody has offended you, think about it, you have offended someone else. So he's saying this. He said, no matter your background. But then he not only moves from background, he moves to another one that's, that I think this is one of the most major issues it is in the world today, and that's race. We are separated by a color of skin. We've been separated by a color of skin. This is the most segregated people are Christians. I hate to say it, the most segregated people in the world are Christians. And can I tell you something else? It's something that's taught. It's something that is taught. Is God, when you come out, I've seen black kids and white kids when they're babies will play all day until they start getting teaching from both sides or whatever side it is. Until someone teaches them there's a difference between me and you, they'll play forever together. They'll get along together. They'll be family together. And God in his infinite wisdom, I, I hear people a lot of times say God is colorblind. I don't believe that. I, I can't go on that because God created colors. And you can't tell me that he's colorblind. He said it is, I created all things. And I created colors, but I created you to love. 
So if he's commanding me to love, then I have to look over race. Yes. And it's a tough job. Believe me, I know it's tough. The other night I watched a movie on TV, and I'm like, and I, and I hate to watch old movies, especially when you start dealing with civil rights and things of that nature. I was looking at a movie, and it, and it, and it, was, it was about mercy with uh, Jamie Foxx in it. And, and, and he was trying to, he had been wrongly convicted. And the way the people were treating him, and I'm like, wow, these people just, they just want to do wrong. They, 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 they just, that much hate is in a person. But when you look at scripture and look at what God said, it's actually not the person. It's what's been taught the person. It's a cliche we use a lot, and it's true. There are some good white people. There are good Mexican people. There are good Puerto Ricans. There are good Chinese. There are good in all race. And there is some good black people. And just like there are good, there is bad in all of them. I used to think that God actually created this for a Christian to learn by. I think sometimes that he put this obstacle out here for us to learn by. We all have, if you take the skin off of us, we're all the same. We, had, we are separating ourselves. We divided ourselves because of color. And that's why this world is torn up like it is today. We're looking at ethnicities, we're looking at races of people, and we're dividing ourselves by races, but before the Tower of Babel, we were all operating on the same plane, learning the same way. Matter of fact, at the Tower of Babel, when God scattered the speech, he says, those people can do whatever they put their mind to. But right now, at this time in our life, I, I, I believe in my heart that if all people were still together and lived together, I believe we, we wouldn't have problems with pandemics. I believe that there is a smart person, smart people out there could have came together and solved this problem. But because evil and Satan plays in the heart and mind of man, he pits us against each other by something as simple as color. He'll keep you separated because of a shade of skin or a color of skin, and we're separated by that. And the job of a true Christian is to see this and know this and still love. You know the wrong that they've done. You know the wrong that happened. But once they've been accepted in the body of Christ, all of that has been erased. As far as you concerned, God has made an atonement for it. He's covered it in the blood. Now it's your brother. It's your sister. And he puts us to the test because he wants us to actually show love even though we know what happened. If you don't think about it, look at what the apostle Paul did. If Paul was judged by his past, how many of us, it wouldn't even be in the New Testament writing. He wrote the majority of the New Testament, and if everybody looked at him and said, that's Paul the persecutor, I ain't going to love him, I ain't going to trust him, I ain't coming around him. If we did that, just think about it, what the world would be. Heaven forbid if you look in your own life and think about the wrong you've done yourself, but somebody still had to love you or somebody still loved you. And heaven forbid a mother, a mother loves her son no matter what. She'll know her son ain't worth two nickels rubbed together with a hole in the middle, but she'll love him the same. And I ain't leaving out the daughters either because they're a disappointment too. They can be a disappointment. People in general can be disappointments. Brothers, sisters, cousins, we can all be disappointment. But God's saying is we learn to love because of God. So he's saying, Paul is, Paul is writing this. He's saying is we got to learn to get past all of this once they are born again because we're dealing with the family of God. And then, of course, nationalities and, 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 and occupations are another issue. My nationality is a problem because we look at the world, we've got Chinese, we've got Muslims, we've got Sunnites. And, and here's the issue. We've been scared into believing that all Muslims are, are, are terrorists and bombing the world. We've been scared that all Chinese belong to Kim Jong and they want to destroy the world. And so we're separated and we don't love them like we should. Amen. And the test is not even though who they are, the test is Paul is saying is we have to get ourselves together. He says we have to keep our heart with all diligence. Means is I have to have a mindset in my heart to love and I got to protect it. No matter what goes on, what I see in the news or what happens, I still have to love that person. And Christians, 
we all know we are some of the woo, strangest people sometimes. We are the most peculiar people. We'll say some things that are not in the word. And sometimes some of us use the word to perpetrate some of the foolishness that we do. We'll go along and, and we'll use the word knowing that it's not right. But we are Christians and we are doing it. And God said we have to love the person but hate what they're doing. See, I hate the sin in your life, but I can't hate the sinner. I have to pray for him. I have to do intercessory prayer a lot of times for him, for God to step in. But he's saying this, that's still your family members. And what Paul is doing here, he's actually starting to work on the family of God, which is the church. And he's trying to get us back in line where we, where we were called to be. See, it wasn't too long ago, it wasn't too far back ago when Christian family was a Christian family. The, the children of God was, was, was intact. Through time, we've been divided, we've been split up and separated. But we didn't start out that way. See, I can remember time back when, when, when you had a problem, no matter how you were, your standing in church was, you could go to the church and the church would help you. I, it, it, I can remember countless a number of times where, where, they, where churches have fed and, and, and had funerals and buried and, 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 and went and represented. I, I, I can remember pastors would go to court with members' children when they get in trouble and stand in character reference for them. Now, it's to the point that we throw everything away. If we find out wrong or we see wrong in it, we quickly throw them away. As the believers, as well as leadership, we'll put them to the side. And Paul here is saying this. He's saying is we have to protect ourselves or be diligent in our hearts to actually show love. Be diligent in it. That means it's a working thing. It's not nothing that's going to come overnight and going to stay. You, your, we all understand that we talked earlier that love is of the will. We will to love through emotions. And because we will to love, that's the issue at hand. Because I will, that means I can sometimes unwill. Or my will can be shaken and I can fall off. And that's what seems to happen a lot of times is our will kind of fades away because of situations, what's going on around us, or, or, or a, a countless number of things that can happen. So he's teaching us, he's saying is, we got to work on this, this will to love and then we got to protect it. We got to get the love down in us. And then we have to be diligent in protecting it because out of the inside of us is what we do. See, the text says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it springs the issues of life. Everything you your, your thoughts, your actions, everything you do came from the inside. It's an inside out action. If you act, you can, I, I, heard, I heard some teaching not long ago, they was talking about that sometimes people can be a good actor on the outside, but have hell on the inside. But the end of the story is, usually the inside comes to the outside. So the act that you had on the outside soon gets took over by what you actually feel on the inside. People today have been, had, have harbored so much hate on the inside now it's coming to the outside. And that's the issue at hand. We've been taught so much hate or we've had so much hate in us. Now it's coming out and it's taking over. Now, Paul knew this was going to happen. The reason why he wrote this text and he says, as Christians, we have to be the forefront. We have to stand for Christ and we have to do the work of the kingdom of God. And if we don't stand up and love each other and act right, who will? See, if, if Christians don't actually learn to walk in love and, and love like, we, like Christ wants us to love, the world's not going to do it. Who's going to do it? After a while, the complete world is going to be at odds. And here's the deal. I heard, I heard something, I heard something, in a, I heard something in a teaching not long ago that it said that the word of fight your fight for you if you use it. It says, the word will answer your problem if you do it. So in other words, says we got to learn to start diligently applying the word to our situations as well as to people to fight the battle instead of us fighting the battle. Because a lot of times the people who we think are in leadership or in charge of us or who we look up to, a lot of times are the people that's wrong. And sometimes God has to chastise them also. But he'll chastise them through word and through prayer. Not through us. 
Now, here's the deal. So he says, no matter if you're rich, got a lot of money, he said, or if you just wear a light, you can be overeducated or you can be the smartest person in the world. He's still saying this, that's still your brother and you still got to love him. And the reason why I'm saying that is because you understand a lot of times when people have gained a lot of wealth or education, they seem to be beside themselves sometimes. Yeah. But the same issue is, is a lot of times they're not. It's just that they think people uh, perceive them that way, so they're standoffish and you are too. Yeah. I, can remember, I can remember having a conversation with a person one day. And a matter of fact, the same thing happened the other day when I was doing my lesson. I was watching Andy Griffith. And it was a lady that came into town, and she had a whole lot of money. Before Andy found out, Andy was, they were just the best of friends. When Andy found out she had a lot of money, he started perceiving that she didn't want to be with him because he, he didn't have nothing, and she had everything, and he started to treat her different. He started to not want, at first they were going out, spending time together, and of course after Barney told him that she was rich and she was just going to play him, then he started thinking like he was told. The next lesson is be careful who speaks in your spirit. He told him that she wasn't going to have time for him, and he started looking at her that way. I think about sometimes in church when you see people, they have a, a section of people that's, that, that and, and it's quite natural. Most people flock together that are of the same type. Most time, educators, they're all friends, and they hang together. It's quite natural because they do the same thing. So I can see them hanging together. But the outside looking in to see them, and we'll say they think they all are that, and then we won't love them. Amen. We don't show them love, and because we don't love them, we're not the example of Christ, and then they won't love back because we don't love them. Can you, underhand, can you understand the left hand washes the right hand, but if I don't wash the right hand, the right hand can't wash the left hand. Amen. The text was teaching us, Paul has been showing us, we have to be examples for each other. Yeah. That's the whole key. I can't go by what you do. I have to do my part, and I have to love and be the Christian that God calls me to be. And through, and through being the Christian that he calls me to be and then applying the word to my life, then God can step in and make adjustments to that person if that person is the issue. But I find most of the time the problem is you. Don't get mad at me if I tell you that, but you use your own problem. Most of the time you think you're all of that when you really ain't. You got a lot of flaws, and when God allows situations to come to you, he's letting that situation come to you because you need fixing. See, you have preconceived notions or, 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 or ways you look at things or, or what you think people are, and most of the time it's you. Most of the time the person ain't nothing like that. Over my years of growing up, I have found out most people that I have perceived to be a certain way was not. And as you get older, of course, you get a little wiser or you get a little bit more sense in your head. You've been knocked down so much. And now you have conversations and this will come up and say, well, I thought you was this way. Or they'll say, I thought you was that way. But no one never said it. You just, you just said that in your heart. They, oh, they, they probably think they all of that because they have a little this, they have a little wealth, or they've been educated, they're college, or they belong to the sororities. And most of the time, they are plain people like we are, and God commands us to love them. He commands us to love them because God understands the power of a love from another person can bring you to the same level. See, my love can make you on the same playing field with anybody else. So he says this. He wants us to see this. He says, so we still have to, uh, we still have an obligation, an obligation to show love. Yeah. This word obligation means is, it's, uh, it's still on us. It means it, it's still a responsibility on us to love. Yeah. When you're obligated, it means you have a responsibility to do it. Didn't ask if you wanted to, didn't ask if you like to. He says, your responsibility to do it because of who you are, not because of any other circumstance out there. Thing about love and, 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 and the command is it's capable to do because it's nothing that's come from emotions or, will or, or thoughts or actions. It's from a will that's inside you. Yeah. It's a lot of times you can love somebody even though they'll be the hatefulest person on the planet. Yeah. But if you will to love, 
then you're walking like the master because when God saved us, remember, all of us, not one of us that the word of God has ever said was walking perfect that he didn't have to save. Everybody was saved. Everybody was walking in sin. Everybody. If you say it like I grew up, it was everybody was wrong. Every one of us was dead wrong. He's saying this, if, if, he, if he looked past our sins and loved us, how much more should my children look past sins to love another? Remember, remember he, he's going to get a little deeper into this, and I want you to hold with me because it's, it's going to get a little closer than where we're at today. Think about this. The reasons why we should be kindly affectionate to each other, he gives us a reason. He says, here's a reason that I want you to see. I want you to look at this particular text of Scripture, and, 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 and let's look at why this, where this command came from. John 13, verses 34 and 35. Let's look at it. This is what he said. He said, the reason why we should be kindly affectionate to each other, because this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now, that's not a scripture you should run through because you need to look at it very closely, verse 34. Verse 34 tells you something that, 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 that's real powerful. He says, a new commandment I give to you, which means is there was an old commandment. In scripture, God has always told us about love and he's taught us and commanded us to love. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, we had a command to love as well as in the New Testament, in the New Testament there was commands to love. But this command of love here that he's talking about, it was based solely off of Jesus Christ. He says this. He says, a new commandment I give to you. Stop. That you love one another. Then hold it right there. Don't run into the next text. He says, a new commandment. He says, now I'm issuing a command to you that you love one another. And then he stopped it right there. But here's the deal. When he picked it back up, he's telling you how to do it. He has to tell us how to do it because he understands natural love or love from the world is incorrect. He says, love, he says that you love one another as I have loved you. He's saying, I need you to love like I love you. Now, this is the part that, 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 that sets you out there. Not to just love like the way you love because a lot of people will say that's just how he is. Oh, you all right with him. Oh, he like you. He just, that's just how he is. Christ didn't leave that door open where you can do that. This is what he said. He says, love like I love you. In other words, what he means that is, he says, that you should love each other like I love you, which means is you should forgive without any strength. You should love without any strings attached. He says, this love that he's talking about is a spiritual godly love. The love is sacrificial love. We all, we, we, we hear the term sacrifice, but we don't really get it deep in our spirit what happened or what actually took place when Christ laid down his life when he didn't have to. He gave up everything that he had out of love for, for us. And we won't give 20 cents out of love. We won't even give a good thought of love. But he said, I don't want you to do that. A person that you, and this goes back to where we were a minute ago. A person that you like, you will do for. You will make sacrifices for. A person that's popular, you will find yourself doing things for. But what about it when it's the person that's not so popular in church or the little family that's very quiet and you don't really know them? Will you actually show them that same type of love? See, he says, Love like I love means to give 100% no matter who you love. The family that you didn't know, the family that's well known, he says, love us all the same way, just like he loved. And that's the issue at hand. He's teaching us, he's showing us, we got to learn to love a certain way. Not just how we think, we got to learn to love just like Christ loved us. You can't, be, you can't be lost on it because it's written down in the word how he loved us. 
if you if you a Christian and you're born again, you you got some idea. You got to have some idea if you hadn't did nothing but read John 3.16. John 3.16 said, for God so loved the world that he gave. He taught us from the beginning. So you know that scripture if you don't know anything else. So he's saying, learn to love, love like I loved others. That's where the commands came from. But he didn't stop there. Go to John 15 and 12. Go to John 15 and 12. Now, again, he says, this is my commandment. Again, he's commanding us. He says, I command that you love one another as I have loved you. He's reassuring you. He's steady teaching you, and he's laying it out that Love like he loved. See, the, 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 the rule of measurement is what Christ done. See, don't love like you think love. Don't love like the love on TV. Don't love like your friend love. Don't love like what you heard. He says, love like Christ love. So see, you can't get, you can't mess that up. It's no way you can love a little bit or don't love too, don't love enough. If you love like Christ, that means you'll give it all. Because that's what he did. He sacrificed it all for us. So it means this, mankind, Christians, practicality, walking practical, spiritual, spiritual Christianity, we should just learn to love each other. Yeah. How in the world, if we don't love each other, can we love the world? Better than that, how can you love Christ when you don't love the brethren yeah. who belongs to him? You don't love his children, he says, how can you love me if you don't love my children? Then he moves a little further, and he says this. 1 John 4, 7, and 8, he actually teaches us again. Now, when John actually writes this, John addresses us a different way. He addresses us as family or as the beloved family. He says, beloved. Now, He's classifying love from the beginning. He says, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Amen. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, John here, when he wrote this, he's actually, he's actually not only reaffirmed what the, what the other writers has taught, but he showed us in a way how we should do it and what's the outcome of doing it or, or what the ending is. In verse 7, it says this in verse 7. Listen to what 7 says again. It says, let us love one another for love is of God. Stop right there. If you notice the colon at the end, he wants you to stop and think about it and don't run on with it. He says, for love is of God. I mean, God is love. God brought love and that's where love originates from. Not only that, it says, and everyone who loves is born of God. If you truly love the brethren, then you don't have to ask yourself. You never wonder if I'm born again. You never wonder who you belong to. If you love, then you have to understand, you know for sure that if I love, then I am of God. Because why? God is love. God, he if you want to know if a person is connected to God, if you want to know if a believer is, is walking with Christ, you'll see the love in his life. Amen. You'll see the love in his life for his fellow man, and especially for those of the household of faith. You'll actually know them by the way they walk in church and how they handle themselves in church. But not only that, then he, he comes along, and, and, and in verse 11, he says something different. He says, Beloved. Now you notice how, notice how, notice how, notice, notice, notice this right here, how John keeps writing and he keeps calling the family or he keeps calling the church beloved or the brother and beloved. He says, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. He's saying this, if God gave it all for you, shouldn't you not give it all to one another? If God can love me, then I can love you. If God loved him and loved me, why can't I love you? My fellow man. Yeah. Granted, 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 granted. We have to understand that love is of the will and love is not something that's born out of emotions. Although emotions are in love, but it's not born out of love. So if I love mankind, if I love the brethren, then I'm acting of what I am. Yeah. 
Now, here's the deal. It's nothing, it's nothing that you can, that comes natural in a sense. It only comes when you're, when you're born again or, or of the spirit. Because it says God is love and love is of God. So I have to have God to have that type of love. See, if a person says they love you but they don't have God, then they don't have true love. Amen. He's laying it out that love is of God, and the only way you can love like God is you have to have God. And then if you got God, he says, you are to love one another. Amen. Remember, we, we were talking about responsibility or obligation. You're obligated to love because you are loved. We, we used to, it was a song they used to sing, especially when I was a kid. I used to hear that song about, yes, Jesus loved me. We, he loved me because the Bible told me so. And then you say, we, you know, he loved me. Be, I love him because he loved me. Yeah. This love is an action word, and it's a reaction word. You tend to love because you are loved. If the Christian shows love to his fellow man, his fellow man will show love back. And here's the key. We can't wait on the response when they are loved back. Yes. See, you can love them and they may not show it right off. But as we all know, and we've all heard it before. If you love a person long enough, that love will win. Because what? Love conquers all. Yes. And most of the time, if you love them, you will love the H-E double hockey sticks out of them. Yes. See, when you love them enough... All that evil will get out of them if you continue to show them love. So, he's saying, learn to love and love like Christ loved us. There's a text of scripture in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Still, he's talking about this command that we were given to love. He says then is, you should not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, I am the Lord. God is just saying now is, no matter what wrong they do to you, your love should conquer the wrong. Amen. It says, no matter what a person says or do, you are still to love them. Yes. Now, he's now putting to work something that you, that, 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 that he's putting your love to the test. That's what God is saying. We love and one of the tests of love is, if someone wrongs you, what will you do? Can you forgive, or do you want to take vengeance, or do you want to take the actions in your own hand? And that's what he's, that's what he's looking at here with that. He's saying this, this, this love that he wants us to have is his love. And because it's his love, we operate in it his way, and that's how this love works. All this is teaching us is this right here. It's actually just showing us that we are to, we're to be in a, we're, we're, we're to handle life totally opposite of where we are. Because we're devoted in brotherly love, we're to walk this particular way that shows love to the brethren. See, because, because those in Christ are in the family that's called the church, it's the reason why we can live and, and, and walk like we do. Now, remember a minute ago, I was, I was saying that we love because Christ loved. We love because Christ first loved us. Well, listen to this one right here out of 1 Timothy 3 and 15. Now, it says here, because these in, the, in Christ are the family, or that we are, because we are called the church, that's why we are the love. Now, here's the deal. Text of Scripture says, but if I am delayed, I write to you that you may know how you, how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. Now, listen closely as I, at the beginning of this one more time as I explain this right here. It says, but if I am delayed, I write that you, that you, that you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves. Practical Christianity and how we should walk. He's saying, this is what you should do. Christ says, if I don't get here to the next 10,000 years, this is what I expect out of you. Yeah. He says that you, now listen to it. He says how you ought to conduct yourself. Yeah. 
He didn't say how the world ought to do, what the world should be doing, how to, he's saying what you should do, how you should conduct yourselves. So, if the right president don't get in who you like, this is how you conduct yourself. He said, if you didn't get the raise you wanted on your job, this is how you conduct yourself. He said, if, if they broke in your house and stole your wealth, this is how you conduct yourself. Watch this one right here. If they murder your family, this is how you ought to conduct yourself. Mm, think about it. That's what he said. He says, this is how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God. When he says in the house of God, he means we are in the house of God because we're born again and we are his children. So he says he's talking to every born again believer. Every born again believer, before you, before you do an act of vengeance, you better think about this right here. He says, the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. It says the pillar and ground of the truth. It is what, it is what our life rests on. It is what our salvation is built on. It's the beginning. It said this is what we should. This is how you should conduct yourselves. And listen to this. It says because we are family of, or of children who have actually been adopted by God. He, now he wants to explain to us identity, who we are, reason why I'm telling us, or reason why he can command us, and the reason why he tells us to live like this, he's trying to deal with identity crisis. Here's the issue, here's the issue. At the beginning of time, all the way till now, at the fall of man, the fall of man happened because of identity crisis. Questioning Adam and Eve on who they were. Again, he's questioning us. Listen what he says, listen what he says in this particular text of scripture that I'm going to move into here. Because we are a family of children who have actually been adopted by God as his sons and daughters, 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18 teaches us and explains to us our identity. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. When we come out from among them, means is when you answered your call and accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he says, you have a new father. You now, you now belong to God. You are not yourselves anymore. You belong to him, which means is you have been adopted. Once you have been adopted, and if you ever know anything about adoption, it means is your old identity ceased to exist. See, you're not what you used to be. See, it's not no more of, you know, Terry Moore the crook. You know, that doesn't exist anymore. See, it's not she level hard to fight her no more. They don't do that no more because they belong to the kingdom of God. See, now you got a new last name. Now you walking in a different light because who you are. If you ever seen a family that has adopted children, especially if you see them when they're small and they bring them into the family and start to train them and teach them their way of life, you would never know that they were adopted if nobody never told you. Amen. See, Christians, when we accept Christ and we start to walk in like Christians, our problem is the world steady tries to tell us that we don't belong. Yes. You, you can't be a, they're quick to say that you can't be a Christian or you ain't a Christian. I thought you was born again. I thought you was this. First thing they want to do is question your identity. Galatians 4, 4 through 6. Listen to that, though. Think about it. We've been adopted. Galatians 4 says this. It says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Yes. Think about it. Listen what it says. Listen what it started off in, in, in verse 4. Verse 4 says the same thing. is teaching us the same thing. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, 
to redeem. Redeem. To redeem means to buy you back. To redeem means I bought you back from the world. I got you back. I paid the price to get you back. He says, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Christ bought us back. Now we are sons of God. I don't, you're no more who you used to be. Quit letting people tell you who you were and, who, and, and, and bringing you back to where you were. We got a bad habit of going back to where we have came from. And most of it comes from the world trying to tell us that we're not who we say we are. I'm a Christian. I cuss a little bit, but I'm a cussing Christian. I fall, but I get back up. What Donna McClurkin said, we fall down, but we get up. Yeah. See, don't let your falls keep you out of the kingdom of God or change who you think you are. Yeah. And then this is what he says. He says, and this is the part I, I want you to really understand. He said, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts. He has put something in us that generates what, who we are now. The Spirit of God is now in us, and because the Spirit is in us, now we have the love of God in us. He's given us what we need to do what he's asked us to do. Loving like God can only be accomplished when you have God's love in you. That's the only way it operates. That's, what, that's the way it works. But not only that, in Romans 8, 16 and 17, it comes about and says this. It says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit of God bears witness with the spirit that's inside you that who you belong to. That happens, and, 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 and here's the deal. One of the issues is, believers, we tend to push the spirit down. We tend not to give spirit the room to work because what we do is we don't allow it to convict our spirit and to correct us when we are wrong. See, the Spirit want to witness you that who you are by bringing, the world used to do this little thing about putting an angel and a little devil on your shoulder. When you do wrong, the little angel over here, the little devil, the angel telling you it's wrong, the devil telling you, oh, it's okay, it ain't really that bad. The Spirit or the Holy Spirit, what it does is it convicts you through the Word of God. When you hear the Word, it teaches you that that wasn't the right thing to do, but all is not lost. It tells you that you're wrong, but it gives you that unction to make it right. And to make it right means to we've been taught how to go and ask for forgiveness. We've been taught to go uh, exalt people. The Spirit of God gives us and equips us with everything we need to do to yeah. be the Christian that we need to be. Yeah. But here's the deal. So believers, the believer is to live in a, in, in, a, in a family member with the brothers and sisters. We are to live like brothers and sisters. Now, for those of you who don't have siblings, I can't say. But for those who have had siblings and, and, and grew up in close families, you understand what the text is basically saying when Paul said, I'm teaching you something that's clear and simple. Most family members were close-knit together. Somehow when you get old, I don't, know, I don't know how you fall out when you get old. But when you're young, you don't fall out like that. You tolerate each other, you forgive each other, and you go on. Sometimes we need to reach back and grab our youth when we deal with our siblings because a lot of us are, got our own families tore up because of us. Yeah. See, we don't want, we, we, we'll push brothers and sisters aside because we got old and we ain't got time for that. But God is saying is these born again believers, these are your family members. You got to treat them just like you did to siblings you grew up with. Yeah. I had a friend of mine. It was it was like nine brothers in the house and one sister. All nine slept together. They all were together and it wasn't like no boys room, girls room. Nowadays, everybody got to have a separate room. These people had a two bedroom house and, and you never knew it. Nighttime came, everybody went to bed at the same time, so everybody bunked out at that time. Everybody got up early and got up and put their bunk up, and you never knew it. Two bedroom, you look at a house and you wonder, like, how all them people lived in there? Yeah. They existed with each other, they ate with each other, they slept with each other, fought for one another, and fought with each other. But that don't happen anymore. But Paul is saying this, that's the issue at hand. We got to get ourselves back to that point to where we live like that. Listen to, this, listen to this quote right here. Listen to this quote right here. 
It says a Christian should be both kind and affectionate to others. We can't just be kind to people. It says be kind and affectionate. Being affectionate means to show love to each other. See, you can be kind to a person and not be affectionate to them. But it says to be kind, kin-like, and affectionate with them. We're to be family. To be family and to show family to each other. We got to learn to show love and walk in love. We got we to gotta break down the barriers. We got to break down the walls inside the family of God before it can leave the walls of a church. Church, we, we, we stuck inside of the walls and we stuck in a way that we cannot show Christ to the world because we can't show love to each other. See, if I can't show love to you, how can I show it to the world? If I can't show my brothers and sisters love, then how am I going to show it to anybody else? That's what, Paul is, that's what Paul is basically dealing with. And he says, Christians, brethren, sisters, we've been commanded to love one another. You, you, we don't have a choice. We know that love is of the will, so we've been commanded to operate that way, to operate, to learn to love no matter what. Because that's what it means. It means to do it no matter what. Were they talking about you last week? Yeah, still love them. Did they say something bad to you last week? Yes, still love them. Did they eat the last piece of chicken? Yeah, love them. Did they steal your lunch at work? Yeah, love them. That's if they're Christians. Now, they ain't Christians. You pray about it and ask God what he wants you to do about it. But born again believers, we are to walk in love. Love got to be part of our lifestyle. Love got to be part of you because God is love. If a person don't see love in you, then they don't see God in you. Amen. Can you imagine that? Without visualize, without seeing love in you, then they don't see God in you because God is love. And if I ain't got that in me, then a person know I ain't who I belong to. It was a, it was a, it was a passage I want you to, I, I, something I wanted you to hear talking about that out of one of the texts we were dealing with. In John, in John, in 1 John 4, 7, 8, and when it said, let us love one another, this is what it was talking about. John had, John had already wrote about that and, and taught about that, that, you know, that we the bus being born again and how love should be a characteristic of a habit of love out of us. We should make it or develop it into a habit for me, which means it's, it should be second nature to us. Not a one-time love, but a constant habit of love. If you ever, if you ever had habits, or if you understand what habits are, habits are repetitive actions done unaware. Yeah. Habitual things you do and don't even think about it. Paul, say First John was saying is we should be in the habit of loving people without even thinking about it. When a, person, when, a person, when a person comes down and, and accepts Christ as a Lord and Savior and joins the church, the church should empty on him. Yeah. It should show him a, a kind of kinship and a family and love that he never experienced before. Mm-hmm. When one of us just having a bad day, we should be flooded with kind words and, and, and uplifting spirits and just treating people like that. That's what Paul, that's what John was teaching us that we're going to have to learn to do. He said, and it, it's habitual because of what you have or who you have on the inside of you. See, if you have his divine nature inside, that's just second nature to you to do. If God is in you, you seek the good in a person instead of the bad. And when you seek that good, you tend to walk in that good. Paul Paul wants to go on a little further in a different direction, but I'm going to hold that to next week because I'm out of time. He's dealing with still us being kindly affectionate to one another, which means is we have to actually show kinship to each other. When he's teaching and he's showing us this in this practical Christianity or this walk that we should have, he's saying is, I want you to start to, to make love habitual in life. Learn to be habitually loving to others, and love will come back to you. Do you not understand that sometimes people don't love us because we're not a lovable person? And we're not a lovable person because we don't show love. See, when you you fail to, to walk in your natural nature, 
of love because God is love and God is in you, when you tend to hold that back, you tend to block blessings out of your own life because you're not a representative of the kingdom of God like he wants you to be. See, when you show love and walk in love, then God can do a lot through your life if you actually start to do that. And that's what Paul is beginning, and that's what he's opening up out of this text of Scripture. He says, be kindly affectionate to one another. That means your brethren in the church, he says, show them love. Show them love no matter what they do, no matter what they say, how they act. Be kind and loving to them because it's an act of your will, not of your emotions. Thank you for this time. I, 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 I pray, that, I, I pray that, 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 that Paul's teaching is reaching us as a church or as believers in the church of God. I pray that we begin to break down barriers and we begin to restore what we have lost. Because Christians, we've lost a lot. We've lost a lot of position. We've lost who we are. And, 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 I'm, and I'm praying that God, that, 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 that he enlightens us in a way that we start to see the things that he wants us to understand and that we can start walking in them and restore the church or the family of the church back to where it should be. I, I don't think anybody anywhere doesn't want to be loved. I don't, think, I don't think nobody is. I think it's a feeling once you get it, it's a feeling that's second to none. And I believe that if we study Paul's word, we listen to Paul's word, we begin to walk that way you'll see changes in your life and changes in the lives of those that are around you. I pray that you have a good week. I pray that the Spirit of God be with you, and we'll see you again next week. God bless you.